Have you ever stopped to think about just how much the humble shipping container has completely and utterly transformed our modern world? Think about it though, we're so used to seeing these things everywhere that we sort of overlook them. They are the logistical backbone of our modern society. They transport everything from car parts and computer components to frozen meats and Lego bricks. And they can be found in every city and every part of the world transporting materials. And when their lifespan as a method of transportation is over, an entire economy has evolved adapting these simple, robust steel boxes into houses, office blocks and sheds, just like this one. As you can see, I've turned this old shipping container into my new workshop. I actually had this delivered here in the back of a lorry a couple of weeks back. A uh, perfect place to keep my 100,000 subscriber plaque and my collection of jerry cans and various things. But I've always been somewhat fascinated by shipping containers. The effects that container shipping has had on the global economy, on the way that our society operates, is so complex and far-reaching that I think it's sometimes very much hard for us to appreciate. The container on its own is a relatively simple metal box, but when used as part of a vast, interconnected and efficient transportation network, it has made the costs of worldwide shipping so simple and so cheap that for many supply chains and companies and businesses, the distances involved in shipping mean almost nothing and the costs of transportation have become almost nil. The story of how these simple metal boxes came to be such a key part of our society is fascinating. But even more interesting is, in a world in which our global economy can grind to a halt based on one single container ship blocking up the Suez Canal, where is our over-reliance on these containers leading us? This is the story of how the container took over the world. This is the Hawaiian farmer. The farmer is now taking on cargo for her return to San Francisco. Several thousand tons of canned pineapple are stowed below the after deck. Into a forward hatch go sacks of coffee beans. Of most interest to the crew are the animals of a circus that has toured the islands and is returning to the mainland. Just 40 to 50 years ago, the concept of containers and container shipping was a small and niche enterprise in the world of cargo transportation. Rather than loading or unloading pre-filled containers, cargo ships arriving at dockyards and ports around the world to disgorge their goods or load up for a journey would fill their holds with the loose and varied arrangements of whatever was needing to be shipped, in ways that had changed little over the centuries. This method of transportation, known as break bulk cargo, however, was riddled with inefficiencies and delays. Break bulk means uh, exactly what it sounds like, that shipments were broken down into small units, small packages. Uh, a typical vessel sailing the North Atlantic back in the mid-1950s would carry perhaps a quarter million separate items. I'm talking about wooden crates straight from the factory, bales of cotton, barrels, bags. This is economist and historian Mark Levinson. My name's Mark Levinson. Who has literally written the book on the shipping container called The Box, how the shipping container made the world smaller and the world economy bigger. Mark kindly agreed to talk to me about the history of the container's development and the impact that it's had on our modern world. Break bulk shipping uh, tended to be slow. A vessel could spend a week or more at the dock being unloaded and reloaded as each of the individual items in the hold had to be removed and then each of the individual outgoing items had to be stowed away in the hold. So the process was quite slow. Uh, there was a lot of cargo damage. There was a lot of cargo theft. Uh, as a result of this, uh, international shipping was really quite expensive and a lot of goods didn't get traded because it wasn't worth it to pay those costs. Some of the best insight we have into the inefficiencies in break bulk cargo was in the form of this report, the SS Warrior, conducted by the US government in 1954. And this was essentially a groundbreaking productivity report that looked at every single aspect of a typical cargo ship's journey. In this case being the SS Warrior leaving from New York and sailing to Germany with a mixed cargo of everything from foodstuffs and commercial items to whole vehicles and mail and everything in between. Now, the SS Warrior was a C2 class ship. 
you can actually see it here. The C2 class were a form of cargo vessel that were designed and built before the Second World War. State of the art for the time, very efficient, had better crew quarters and all sorts. You can actually see here a plan of them and you can see three holds aft, you've got your bridge and accommodation amidships and then you've got your three holds up forward and then, well, in this case, four masts that would have been used for either raising or lowering cargo in and out of the different holds. Now, in the case of the SS Warrior, she was carrying about 5,000 tons of mixed cargo. But the most fascinating thing in the report was this table, the cargo aboard the Warrior. And it's broken down not by the items, but how the items were packaged. Cases, cartons and bags, boxes, bundles and packages. You can see it's even broken down here by drum, can and barrel. Entire wheeled ve vehicles was 53 just whole vehicles loaded into this and then things like undetermined 1525 now it's also important to note that all of these different packages all would have varied in size and shape too there was no defined shape of a carton there was no defined weight or size of a drum or a can or a barrel and all of these things would have to be handled individually and packed into the hold now out of that 5,000 tons, it made up in total 194,582 individual items that would all have to be found a place for in those six holds. And remember, all of those items were arriving at that Brooklyn dockyard for up to a month before the ship actually sailed. So we have about one and a half thousand separate deliveries to the dockyard from 151 or 152 different cities. And then they are all being offloaded off the trains or carts or lorries, whatever it is delivering them to the dockside. They're being removed by hand, packaged onto pallets and stored in a warehouse. But of course, we're not shipping them in the pallets. What would happen is those items would then have to be removed from the pallets and repacked into the holds and then all held in place with, as the report details, thousands of dollars worth of dunnage, but essentially wood and rope to keep it all secure. This would have been long, back-breaking and unbelievably dangerous work for these longshoremen, packing the holes with all these unusual items. At one moment, you could be carrying bags of coal. The next moment, that same longshoreman could be trying to pack Fabergé eggs into a small part of the hold as well. You had to ensure that they didn't shift underway. You had to make sure nothing was falling or breaking. It was unbelievably difficult, but more importantly, time-consuming and expensive work. It took about six days to actually fill this hold with teams of longshoremen working throughout the day. It took about 11 and a half days to actually go across the Atlantic and it took about six or four days to actually unload it all in Germany. Now about 11.5 percent of the total cost of actually shipping all of those materials was the sailing itself, the trip across the Atlantic. Almost 40 percent was just the work on the dock sides themselves. And the report itself clearly wasn't very happy with this. Um, in Mark's book, you can actually see the conclusion that was drawn by the authors. Perhaps the remedy lies in discovering ways of packaging, moving and stowing cargo in such a way that brake bulk is avoided, they wrote. But that's the million dollar question. How do you replace brake bulk cargo? It was the way things had been done for hundreds, if not thousands of years. Well, it turns out the answer would come from somebody who had no experience in the maritime industry at the time. And his name was Malcolm McLean. Malcolm McLean was a, a road haulier. He'd over time built a very large uh, trucking company in the United States. He became worried in the early 1950s because there was an automotive boom in the United States. There were a lot more cars on the road. This was slowing down his lorries. And he thought that maybe if he were able to put his trucks onto a ship and carry them down the Atlantic coast, that he'd have lower costs and more reliable delivery. Pretty soon became clear that this idea didn't make sense. But driving these trucks onto the ship took up a lot of space. So through his own development, he came to the idea that maybe you should just take the cargo compartment off the, the lorry. And this is what he did uh, with the first container voyage in April 1956. As a concept and method of transportation, McLean's idea of utilising containers pre-filled and ready to be loaded onto ships was nothing new. In fact, numerous enterprises from train lines and shipping companies had experimented with containerization over the years. However, the lack of standardization and systems in place to handle containers meant they offered few advantages. Oftentimes, containers would still have to be loaded by hand, stacked with loose cargo in awkwardly shaped holds, and few lorries or trains were ready to accommodate or carry them, often forcing the containers containers to be hand-loaded and unloaded at dockyards, 
further adding to delays and costs. Maclean's vision, revolutionary at the time, was that of an efficient system built entirely around the container. Loose, brake bulk cargo would be done away with. Containers would be lifted onto and off ships with the use of cranes to avoid gangs of longshoremen. And perhaps most importantly, Maclean's containers would work interchangeably with ships, trucks, or trains. To create his perfect container and the system that would support it, in early 1955, Maclean found Keith Tatlinger. Tatlinger was an engineer who had in 1949 designed what was, in essence, the world's first modern shipping container, a 30 foot long aluminium box that could be stacked too high for use on either ships, trucks or trains, but it had seen little uptake in the transportation industry. Maclean, however, clearly saw the potential in his designs and outlined to Tatlinger his plans. The ships of his new Pan-Atlantic Steamship Corporation would be converted from World War II era T2 oil tankers, but built with a new framework above the deck where containers could be loaded and offloaded by crane and, most importantly, safely locked in place for transit. Another innovation came in the form of loading. Most cargo ships of the time had winches in place on board for both loading and removing the cargo, but handling such large and heavy containers would destabilise the ship. Instead, McLean had two large revolving cranes from a disused shipyard sent to Houston and Newark where the ships would sail from, meaning all loading could be conducted using shoreside cranes that could easily hook onto the containers for quicker loading and removal. Finally ready for service, on the 26th of April 1956, McLean and his executives and a few gathered dignitaries watched from the Newark dockside as the Ideal X, their new strange converted oil tanker, was loaded with Tatlinger's newly designed aluminium containers, now fitted with corner pieces that could lock the containers in place on deck. It had been months of negotiation with the government officials to approve both Pan Atlantic's new shipping route and the unusual design of the ship. However, the results were immediate. The Ideal X was loaded in less than eight hours and set sail that same day. In a world still dominated by the slow toil of brake bulk cargo, it was almost unheard of. But for Maclean, the greatest vindication for his ambitious plans would come in the form of the costs. In 1956, loading the loose brake bulk cargo in a similarly sized ship cost $5.83 per tonne. For the journey on the Ideal X, it cost just under 16 cents. McLean had cracked the code. He understood that rather than adapting the container to suit the industry, it was the industry in its entirety that would have to adapt. Trucks, trains and ships, ports and dockyards would all have to fit the container, not the other way around. The era of the container had officially arrived, and for those who didn't adapt in time, they would find themselves very quickly being left behind. Before we dive back into the exciting drama of the shipping container, a quick thanks to my awesome sponsor this month, War Thunder. Now, if you've already watched my previous video on the German Rescue Boys, then you've heard me talk about the reasons that I love War Thunder, with its immersive PvP combat and using the most realistic and varied selections of planes, tanks, ships, torpedo boats and anti-aircraft Humvees in any game ever. There's also the beautiful variety of maps, from Arctic oceans to boiling deserts and ruined towns. I'm a sucker for for details and the incredible attention to detail that the team at War Thunder put into every aspect of the game has always amazed me, but so much so that I'm actually using it to research a project, or at least that's what I tell people when they come in and find me playing games when I should be making videos. But I'm working on a story about the HMS Edinburgh and her sister ship, the HMS Belfast, is in War Thunder. And honestly, the X-ray mode has been incredibly useful, but I won't spoil any more about that. Now, I have also mentioned before that I need friends to play with at War Thunder, so I will get some games organized. Sign up in my link in the description below and also join my community Discord. You'll find the details there and we can maybe get something organized in the future. Now, I play on PC. Well, actually, I play on Mac, but War Thunder is available on PC, Xbox Series X or S, PS5, you name it. Thanks again, War Thunder, and let's get back to the rise of the shipping container. Shoreman strike spreads along the entire Atlantic and Gulf coasts. In the first week, the walkout by 60,000 dockers cost the nation over $100 million. The dockers' rejection of the new contract seems to stem from fear of automation, just as in the prolonged strike two years ago that cost the country an estimated $1 billion. While the container was no overnight success, as the years went on, containerization became harder and harder to ignore for freight businesses fighting to compete and for both harbours and longshoremen who feared the vast 
changes that the container system would usher in. Historical harbours in America and Europe were simply not suitable for the requirements of large container shipping, and before they knew it, their centuries-old industries had found themselves sidelined and abandoned. Traditionally, ports had been located in the centre of major cities. In most cases, the city had grown up around the port. So you had this whole, what we'd call today, an ecosystem. Uh, you'd have the docks in the center city, you had the neighborhoods where the dock workers lived close at hand, and you had many of the industries right close at hand. When container shipping came along, it almost instantly made all of this obsolete. In places like London and, and San Francisco and New York, the port simply moved. Uh, in, in the UK, there was a new port created at Felixstowe, and most of the port activity in London just went away. These docks, which had been there in some cases for hundreds of years, just closed up. And many of these neighborhoods, East London included, sank into depression for a prolonged period of time uh, before new kinds of, of economic activities developed. Containerization was bringing rapid and earth-moving change everywhere it went. However, the growth of container shipping and the rush to adapt by numerous companies and organisations was risking the container becoming just as complex and inefficient as the method it was beginning to replace. McLean had originally insisted on his Pan-Atlantic Corporation, later to be renamed Sealand Containers, to be 33 foot long, a requirement dictated by the space available on the P2 oil tankers they had originally converted. Just a year after the Ideal X had sailed for the first time, however, McLean intended to bring in a series of C2 type cargo vessels converted to hold a honeycomb of cells that could carry up to 226 containers, four times that of the Ideal X. As a result, new 35 foot long containers, slightly longer and with corner locking posts designed to be better stacked and secured together, were created. Other companies, such as the Matson Navigation Company, designed containers to be used on their mixed brake bulk and container services running to Hawaii, measuring 24 feet long. At the same time, the US Army had been experimenting and seeing success with their smaller Container Express, or context boxes, during the Korean War. In Europe, containers were typically made with wooden planks and steel reinforcement. In a America, steel or aluminium was commonplace. Some could be moved with cranes and hooks, some stacked, some locked in place, some shifted with forklifts. It was becoming a logistical nightmare. The key development in uh, intermodal transportation, as we call it today, was standardization. And this challenge, starting in the late 1950s, set off 10 years of negotiation. Uh, I regard the people who engaged in this process as the unsung heroes of containerization. If you can imagine spending 10 years sitting in smoke-filled rooms, arguing about things like, how thick should the end wall of a container be? That's what we saw going on. The industry agreed that the standard container sizes would be 20 feet and 40 feet. We still have the standard 40-foot container today. They also agreed on what's known as the corner fitting. If you look at a container, there are eight pieces of steel, one on each corner of the, the box, and there's a hole in it, in each of those pieces of steel, and that's how the container can be lifted by a crane or can be attached to other containers through a fitting that goes into that hole. But once that was standardized with a 40-foot box, then any container could be lifted in any port anywhere in the world. And now it made sense to invest in container ships, now, if you were a manufacturer, you could put your goods into a container and be very confident that it was going to be handled at the other end of the voyage. It was this slow but steady adoption of universal standardization within the industry that eventually grew the container trade into the vast scale that we see today. By 1980, containers were able to move around 11 million tonnes of cargo, a large but still niche proportion of how most general cargo at the time was being transported. By 2022, that same number is as high as 2.82 billion, and over 90% of non-bulk cargo worldwide is transported by container ships. The container itself, despite the many revisions and changes over the years, looks remarkably similar to those first aluminium boxes loaded onto the Ideal X in 1956. The Ideal X was only ever intended to carry containers on her open deck, lashed side by side. However, as more conventional cargo ships, including the famous SS Warrior, were converted into container ships, increasing capacity was made beneath the decks. Modern container ship capacity is measured in 20-foot equivalent units, or TEUs, the agreed ISO standard for 
for a 20 foot long container. The Ideal X could carry 58 33 foot containers, giving her a sub 100 TEU capacity by modern standards. However, Malcolm McLean's successor ships quickly upped that number to 228. By 1971, the Liverpool Bay was launched with a capacity of 2,961 TEU. In 1985, the American New York carried 4,614. By 1997, the Sovereign Maersk came into service, almost doubling the New York with a whopping 8,160 TEU capacity. Then came the Emma Maersk at 14,770, the CSCL Globe at 19,000, and the OOCL Hong Kong at 21,413. In 2022, the 400 metre long Ever Alot came into service, capable of carrying a staggering 24,004 20 foot containers. The scale of modern container ships and the economy that they represent is immense, especially compared to the early experiments with Maclean's Ideal X. But it's this size and scale that's creating strain within the very system that allowed the container ship to grow so large in the first place. On the 23rd of March 2021, the Ever Given, a 20,000 TEU container ship, found itself buffeted by strong winds on a passage through the Suez Canal. Soon the bridge lost control of the massive 265,000 ton ship and it ran aground, pulling the stern around and entirely blocking the channel to traffic. It would take six days before the Ever Given could be freed, but the ramifications of the incident went far beyond a few days delay. Billions of pounds of cargo found itself caught up in ports at sea or on either end of the canal. Ships delayed by the Ever Given were now arriving late or at the same time as each other, creating chaos at ports as containers and goods piled up. But the issue that the Ever Given incident represented was that the container ship was simply becoming so large, so unwieldy, that much of the infrastructure around them is struggling to cope. A lot of the decisions to build supply chains were really based on production costs and transport costs. The transport costs internationally were very low thanks to the container. And so companies would say, well, we're paying someone five pounds an hour to do this in the UK. But for the equivalent of a pound 50, somebody can do it in China and add in a few pence for shipping costs and we can land the stuff in the UK for a third as much as it would take to produce it here. Okay, And this accounting, which was really based simply on, on wage differences, didn't take into account risk. Risk here became a greater and greater problem as these supply chains became more and more complex. A, a company might have a, a supplier three or four or five links down its supply chain. In other words, a company that headquarters had never heard of that made something that went into this, that was then incorporated into that, which went into this component, which finally went into the assembled product. And this, the situation with risk became worse as the ship lines built bigger and bigger ships. Many people in the shipping industry believe that ships have gotten too large. It doesn't make sense anymore to have a ship that can carry 24,000 to 20 foot containers. It takes too long to unload. It's not flexible. There are a lot of ports that can't handle a vessel of that size. So this really led to some retreat from the globalization of manufacturing. This was already happening before COVID-19 came along. As companies properly assessed the risks, they saw that maybe some of these supply chains didn't make so much sense. The growth in international trade in goods has been slower than the growth of the world economy for a number of years now, except during the pandemic in 2021. And I would expect that that's going to continue. I think we're going to continue to have a significant amount of international trade. Globalization isn't going away, but more and more globalization really has to do with moving digits, not with moving physical manufactured goods. In many ways, the impact of the container is a matter of interpretation, a lens from which we see numerous viewpoints. To many, it represents the crowning achievement of globalization, standardization and cooperation, a movement which has helped make the world smaller and accessibility of products wider to everyone. To some, the container is historical and cultural change, an item that revolutionized an ancient industry, but in the process destroyed a rich culture with automation and efficiency. And to others, it's the perfect symbol 
of our consumerist society, one of wastefulness and disposability and environmental damage, of exploitation of low-wage markets brought about by the rise of cheap global trade. It's this breadth of feelings and opinions on a simple metal box that highlights its impact, one that has brought historic change to everything that it has touched and helped create a world that would be unrecognisable to those just living 60 or 70 years ago. While researching this video, I actually went and stayed on the Cap San Diego. It's tied up in Hamburg, and it's a German cargo liner. You can actually see it here, um, some details about its renovation. It's tied up now. It does some cruises, but it is essentially a, a floating hotel. And, of course, that was the point with a cargo liner. The idea was uh, you had your regular holds that you could fill up in a break bulk manner, and then there was quite a luxurious uh, accommodation block with, uh, in the case of the Cap San Diego, there's a swimming pool and a bar, and... It's sort of, in my opinion anyway, the pinnacle of cargo ship design before the age of the container. And the reason I bring it up, I think it's quite fascinating because there's another book that I have here called The Ship by Bjorn Landstrom. And this is a book that was made again in the early 1960s. And this book is the most exhaustive history um, that I, I've ever read on our human maritime history. It goes all the way from Roman times and Egyptian quinquiremes, uh, uh, Japanese junk, Spanish galleons, there's World War II battleships, there's obviously the most famous vessel, the inflatable pig. But what's fascinating is there's a whole section here at the end all about cargo ships. But what's interesting is they don't mention containers. Uh, it's completely absent. And it's remarkable to me, and I think it's quite telling because it really shows how slowly then quickly the container ship basically completely took over and i think what's quite fascinating is you can actually see lovely breakdown of what basically older uh break bulk cargo ships were like uh there's sections here about cargo liners you can see there's different designs some here i believe are french uh, swedish german vessels very similar to the cap san diego um that i stayed on but it's amazing to think that when this book was written by bjorn landstrom in the 1960s the container still hadn't reached the standardization phase there was still men in smoky rooms arguing about corner fit and various things like that but only a couple of decades later these things would be consigned to the history books and the container ship would take over almost completely and you know this isn't to say that we're looking at containers now and in 40 years time there's going to be a completely new method of transportation but at the same time somebody on that dockyard in new york or new jersey in the 1950s or 60s was probably saying that about containers so it's 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 really interesting this book was actually sent to me by a friend uh, just before i started recording this video um and i thought it was just perfect i i basically opened it up the first time to this page saw the cap san diego which i'd stayed on this isn't the cap san diego but it's a very similar ship and i thought it was just a, a really really um interesting piece of of history uh especially i think the absence of the container ship in this book anyway thank you very much for watching that um this was a very difficult subject for me to cover because there's so much and there's so much i had to cut there's so much that i wanted to talk about but the issue i had was that i didn't feel i knew enough about it there's a big difference between reporting on like history and the history of small objects and niche subjects and then there's something as big as <clears throat> global economies <laughs> and you know that's a difficult thing to talk about and that's why the biggest thanks in the world has to go to mark uh, mark agreed to sit down and talk to me i mean mark has written the box he's also written a new book called outside the box which deals with sort of the <laughs> all of the the new aspects to global trade uh, as a result of the last couple of years that we've been living through uh, but for him to basically you know read my email out of the blue agree to sit down and chat to me and and give me such an amazing insight into this world. And th this entire video wouldn't have been possible without him. I hope you guys liked uh, having the, the switch between the two of us, but I felt there was a lot of stuff he was saying that, that felt a lot better just coming from him. I could have just written down what he'd said and then re you know, said it myself as if I knew what I was talking about. But I thought, let's... Uh, Let's hear from the man himself. And I would really recommend his book. Um, it's it's truly fascinating. I was reading his book as we were traveling around Europe this year. And that's when I got the idea to go to Hamburg to, to visit the Cap San Diego. And um, it was really buying my container that you saw at the start of the video that, that gave me the idea to do this. But like all things, you end up falling down this rabbit hole of exploring every single part of the, the history of it. Um, so yeah, amazing fun. 
If you guys liked that interview, I might actually put the full interview up on my Patreon. There's a few questions that we didn't talk about. There's a few things that we shortened down. We talked for about an hour. Um, so I might actually put the entire interview up on my Patreon page if you're interested in that. And obviously that's an amazing way um, to, to support my work. Uh, it pays for a lot of these materials and various things that I'm buying. You know, it costs eight, costs, it costs 80 pounds to buy an ISO standard. I, I went to buy one of, there's dozens that control, you know, containers. This is uh, ISO 668 Series 1 Freight Containers Classification. When I put this in my basket on the ISO Standards website, I thought it was eight pounds and it was like 90 quid. It was like 88 pounds. Couldn't believe it. So um, this is what the patrons uh, pay for. I never even used it properly in the video, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, <laughs> I'm not gonna get into the, the cost of ISOs, but, but still, um, really, really appreciate your support as always. And also my sponsor, War Thunder. Thanks uh, again. Um, for for supporting and also um, I I have wasted quite a lot of time this month playing War Thunder when I should have been researching this video. Um, but it's great, you know. You could play War Thunder for free on Mac, on laptops, on your PC. Your well, I've got a PS Five. Um, I love just being able to switch between them. Uh, I'd like to actually maybe get a a, a Steam Deck. Uh, I've been seeing those. Um, I wouldn't mind playing playing a game on that. Uh, but Anyway, if you would like to play Water or Thunder for yourself, look at the link in the description below. Uh, if you'd like to play with me uh, at War Thunder, have a look at the Discord. Um, I'll, I'll leave that down there below as well. I'll try and get a game organized. I am pretty busy, but we'll try and get something organized. And a big thank you to everyone who has watched and, and, and supported um, my videos. I, I must just one note. My previous video, uh, which is on the, uh, the German Rescue Boys, has done unbelievably well. It's the, the most popular video I've ever made um, in terms of the, you know, how quickly uh, it, it just blew up. And I don't really know why, but <laughs> all I want to say is thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you also for 100,000 subscribers. I, I don't ever like to talk about these milestones very much because I think they just clog stuff up. But I, I appreciate you guys a lot. So uh, thank you very much. I'm going to go now put away all these books because I have been gathering books and models of containers and various things like that. If you're interested, I'll leave a link to that model of the container that you saw as well. I'll leave a link to that below. I got it on eBay. Um, and you can get them in different names and colours. That was meant to be a Sealand one, but the guy accidentally sent me a Maersk one, which annoyed me slightly because it's meant to it's meant you know sea land it's meant to be the 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 one the malcolm mclean one but anyway you can't control every prop and stuff but uh yeah thank you very much for watching and we'll see you later bye bye